Welcome to the final, the final session of Unreal Fest Europe 2019. It's a bittersweet moment, but hopefully we'll end on a high note. So uh, thank you for coming to this panel. Uh, we're going to be discussing a bunch of different things today. Uh, the names of all of the uh, participants are behind us, and I'll start by introducing myself. My name is James Golding. I'm one of the engineering directors at Epic. Um, to my left is Joachim Olander, who just gave a speech in this room. He's one of the senior game engineers at Jaeger. Uh, next to him is Jack Smith, joining us from Splash Damage. Uh, ben Marsh is uh, a fellow Epicite. Uh, and on the end is Ben Wyatt from Rocksteady. So the aim of today's panel is we want to talk a little bit about the learnings that people have had from making games with Unreal. Everyone on this stage is, is very experienced with the engine, has gone through a lot of different iterations and, and has a lot of experience with the engine. And we wanted to make sure we could try and share some of that experience, some of those learnings for teams that are maybe on their first project and really answer the question, what did you learn during your last project that you changed for the next project and, uh, and try and sort of pay that forwards a little bit and help other teams understand. And maybe there'll be some differences of opinion of, well, we do it this way, we do it this way, and you'll see some of the areas where there's difference of opinion and maybe more than one way to, to skin a cat. Um, so one of the first topics I wanted to talk about was uh, taking engine drops, taking new versions of the engine. So before we, we turn to the panel, I was kind of curious, I might walk this backwards. We'll do a show of hands in the audience. So who, who is brave enough to have switched their project to 422 a week after it's come out? You brave souls, oh, yeah. deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Um, we salute you. Um, okay, so let's walk backwards. 421. Oh, quite a lot. Okay, so 420. All right, uh, 419. Getting a bit lower. 18. Okay, earlier than like 17. 17 and earlier, quite a few. Wow, that's quite, that's quite impressive. There aren't many hands at all. Uh, anyone still on Unreal Engine 3? <laughs> um, two? <laughs> oh, there's, there's a hand over there. I salute you, sir. Um, so yeah, so let, let's start down the panel, maybe with Joachim. So what's your sort of policy for, uh, for taking engine drops? Let's, let's start with that first. Like how, how often do you do it, and, and how do you do it? So as often as we potentially can. Uh, the thing is, we're a live game where we consistently need to be able to create new releases. And basically merging it right when we're try trying to create a new release becomes something that's pretty hard. So you need to basically synchronize it a lot with production. But to a large extent, we wait until we don't take preview builds. We take it once it has been finally released, and it's all good. And after then, we, uh, an engineer spends around a couple of days merging it over, resolving conflicts, and so on and so forth. We run a QA pass, and it usually takes a week or two, and then it's in. So it's not really massively complicated. It's just, to a large extent, how we run with it. Jack, is that similar? Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot about how you do the setup initially yeah. to make sure that you are, you know, you're aware that these things are going to happen, right? And you have a plan in place. So um, luckily for me, Valentin, one of our uh, uh, lead engineers, gave a talk earlier this afternoon that kind of covers a lot of what we do at Splash Damage. But um, at a high level, it's just educating the team that you know these things are going to happen. They're beneficial for the game. Um, we have some kind of simple rules around you know if you're making engine changes, for example, they have to follow a very specific comment markup that's easily searchable. You know we can run automated tools to go over and kind of catalog all the engine changes we've made. Um, we have stricter rules about code reviews for those things as well. Um, but in general, as kind of a, you know, as somebody who's leading engineering teams, the best thing that comes out of the stuff that Epic have been doing is, you know, there's much more consistent release cadence for engine updates now, which means that we can plan further ahead for when these things are going to hit us in production. Um, and so, you know, making live service games, it's super important that you can continue to take all the, the great stuff that comes out of the engine that you need, um, benefit from the kind of, uh, you know, the, the engineering team at Epic and the content team at Epic. Um, but then, you know, being able to, to say with confidence how long it's going to take you because you've got a, you've got a process and you've got a plan uh, is super important. Um, ben Wyatt, down the end. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's much the same as uh, you guys. So uh, we normally try and take every other release, um, but usually there's something so tempting in each release that we, uh, we just go for it anyway. Um, I guess because of the quantity of changes we've made to the engine now, it's, it's starting to take longer and longer with each uh, integration we do. And I think we're kind of looking at four to eight weeks per integration now. Um, it can get pretty, pretty uh, gnarly. So I think particularly with the 422, we've just started that and uh, just hitting all the problems with the new rendering refactor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think we do all the same things like tagging our own changes within the engine so it's very visible to, uh, to the people who are integrating. Um, 
We have a few scripts and things that can help us. We do routines like uh, any files that have been deleted in Epic, we have uh, Python scripts that scan those for any of our own changes so we can kind of understand what changes we've lost and you know, what we need to migrate. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. Um, Mr. Marsh, did you have anything to add or any sort of suggestions for people taking drops? I can say a little bit about what we do on Fortnite, I guess. Um, uh, I think about 18 months ago or so, we were in a really bad... Uh, Fortnite was off using its, uh, its own version of the engine that was really, really old. And that merge process where we took uh, the latest version at the time was really, really painful. And so we kind of decided there and then that we'd, we'd really try and do it more often. And kind of have the advantage that we can cheat a little bit with the schedules. So we try and uh, match up uh, engine releases to kind of the length of a, a Fortnite battle pass, which is like 10 weeks or like a, a quarter, so that we can try and line those things up and uh, always take every engine release into Fortnite and make sure it's, um, it's kind of like a good uh, test bed for the engine as well, make sure that we, um, we're not breaking anything, it's suitable for shipping with a live game. Um, this time around, 4.22, was, uh, we kind of missed our dates a little bit, and we ended up taking... Uh, it was actually before 4.22 was released, we integrated it into Fortnite for the 8.30 release, which I think we come out this week, something like that. Um, but yes, um, so yeah, the idea was to, um, uh, to integrate at the start of a season so that uh, whenever we have engine changes, we're kind of guaranteed that we'd have bigger patches, and that kind of coincides with, like, you know, there's going to be a big, uh, big changes in the map and things like that. Um, and so people won't be put off so much by the size of the download and things like that. Um, is there any, you mentioned a little bit, everyone sort of things like marking up changes and documenting and things like that. Is there anything that you've maybe done in the past that you've made a, a definite change in process around the sorts of changes you make to the engine or the way you approach those or the way you structure big changes to the engine now to make drops easier? Yeah, like from our end, it's like, but it's primarily motivating why you need to make the change. Like, I think there's a lot of times in the past we were like adding just null pointer access or whatever, like, oh yeah, engine crash, let's get a null pointer or whatever in. And by that margin, we were then just basically accumulating changes over and over and over again. So a large aspect it comes that for every single engine change that you're actually introducing, it comes more from just why are you making the engine change? Do you actually understand your system you actually are modifying? Because if you know the system you're actually modifying, then merging a new change over becomes way more easier because you just simply have a broader understanding about what you're actually doing. So it becomes more about actually providing larger knowledge sets to what you're actually applying. Yeah, I think it's one of the cases where it's actually beneficial to add more friction yeah. to the process of making a change. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you want people to actually take a step back and really think, why do I have to make this change? Yeah. You know, um, I would say that the first and foremost thing you should be doing is going to UDN, asking if you feel like you need to make an engine change, then it's likely that you're probably missing something somewhere else that could be doing it differently. Um, aside from that, maybe do it in a separate module at the engine level that kind of uh, you know, just adds the functionality you need um, instead of making an engine change. Because you know, every single change you make is you know, another weight that's dragging you down when you want to do another engine upgrade. Mm. It sounds quite drastic, but as they accumulate over time, it's really, really difficult. Cool. Um, so the next thing I wanted to, to move on to was uh, sort of infrastructure. Obviously, this is you know sort of may seem a, a sort of dry topic, but it's absolutely vital to sort of operating efficiently as a studio. So I wonder if maybe I could sort of go down the line and talk a little bit about. I mean, some of you like Ben have talked a little bit about this in some of the talks during the, the show, but maybe just to reiterate, uh, in terms of sort of what the setup is for. Um, both for creating builds and maybe automated testing as well. I'm sort of curious to know how different studios tackle tackle those problems, maybe what products they use, what the setup is, that kind of thing. Maybe start with you, Joachim. Sure. So like, we have a huge build infrastructure that we built across, I guess, like 20 years of full development. We're, we are not using UGS. We're simply using, a, like, we have basically coded our own tool, which is to a large extent what UD, UGS is. We just called it Vampire instead. Um, but a lot of extent, it's simply that a lot of people use Vampire and uh, ourselves basically as coders, we predominantly use Perforce. We submit, and then we have snapshots running, of course, on every build that also runs automation, static code analysis, produces cooks about every single snapshot you do, which can be outputted and reused by QA, and then like, predominantly have that on every single branch that we are doing. And this also update, uploads to our individual backend server, making sure that every single change that gets done also gets reflected automatically to our backend. And yeah, it just basically is super automated for a lot of changes we have. I mean, we've got, there's quite a few projects at Splash Damage, yeah. so I'm not, I can't speak for every single one. Um, but in general, you know, 
companies and studios can spend a hell of a lot of money and time developing a tool that basically does exactly what UGS does. Yep. So if you haven't already created that stuff, I'd really suggest checking it out. Um, for, for newer projects, we definitely have started to use UGS. We made some uh, minor modifications just to the way we work as a studio. But in general, being able to, being able to mark up editor builds as, you know, this has been verified by some kind of automated testing function at least, or, you know, some QA process, and it's, it's able to be, you know, you should sync it, you should start working on it. Because the last thing you want to do is just have content creators not able to do their work because a change from, you know, from mainline has, has broken the build. Um, so definitely UGS is an important part. Um, we have continuous integration running with, uh, you know, Team City and Build Bots, and as uh, Valentin alluded to in his earlier talk, we do a lot of kind of uh, automated testing and validation actually before changes can even go into Perforce. So we generally don't submit code changes directly to Perforce. We do it indirectly through a tool that um, validates that it doesn't break the build. Do you feel like that provides a lot of friction? Yes, but... In a good way? <laughs> in a good way. So uh, you kind of have to, if you want to do these things with, with the team, the team has to be bought into it. You know, you can't, you can't put these processes in place if nobody on the team believes that they're actually important or they're going to make a better product. So for me, the first hurdle is actually talking to everybody on the team and, and understanding, you know, getting a common understanding of why it's important um, for builds to be stable, why it's important that we test before things go into mainline, talking about the impact it has on every member of the team. You know, it might take half an hour or an hour for an engineer to submit her changes to Perforce, but in doing that, if that change was to break a build and stop 50 other devs from being able to work for an hour, it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer in terms of the wasted or the saved time, rather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I mean, we, get, we use UGS, as you might imagine. Um, for Fortnite, we have uh, our build machines uh, checking binaries for everybody. Um, but there are quite often just like little side projects that spin up where we fall back to that functionality in it where everybody can compile from source code as well, just to, uh, just to sort of get going quickly and things like that. Um, our, all of our infrastructure is built around, uh, our build infrastructure is built around a product called Electric Commander, which uh, I don't recommend very highly. <laughs> uh, but we have a lot of, um, it's kind of interesting, like we script all of our, our build systems using uh, build graph, and we kind of use like a little bit of electric commander to just dynamically create job steps and things like that, and set up dependencies between them. And we're kind of locked into it just because we're using this little, um, this little portion of the product and lots and lots of glue code and, and history that's, that's already there now. But yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, so uh, we use TeamCity as our main kind of uh, build management. Um, we don't use uh, Unreal Game Sync. I guess it kind of came along after we set up our own sort of system. Um, I guess something that's very important at Rocksteady is our development velocity. So we're very much about uh, getting in changes quickly and published to the team as, as quickly as possible. But um, we have introduced a uh, like a pre-commit stage, I guess, similar to what many studios are doing now. But um, I guess in our goal to try and keep that as quick as possible, we just do a few local tests which are very much targeted at the sorts of changes which most, which, uh, most typically break the build. So, um, for example, that would be uh, on your own machine, it would compile uh, your changes or just the files you've modified for PS4 <laughs> as uh, just being on a different compiler just naturally throws up a few things and, of course, <laughs> being on a, a console platform. Um, and it does a few kind of very basic parsing of the files to see if there's anything unusual there. Um, one useful thing that's also come up for us is uh, the kind of the most common thing that used to break our builds was uh, changes to classes or blueprint classes, which modified the interface of um, functions or properties or things that were exposed. And so then if you deleted a property, which a blueprint somewhere is referencing, um, the build breaks. So uh, what we've uh, put into our pre-submit tool is uh, something that detects if you've made a change that's a kind of along those lines. Um, and gives you the option uh, to say, do you just want to check if this has broken any blueprints in the game? Which, if you click that, it goes off and runs a commandlet that verifies just by loading all the blueprints which are 
referenced by the, uh, the classes you've uh, modified just to see if anything of, uh, anything's broken. And that can take you know, between two and 10 minutes or so, depending on what's been modified. Uh, but that almost entirely solved that particular problem for us and um, kind of went from having broken builds almost every other day to, well, far less frequently. That sounds really familiar to, uh, really similar to the, I mean, I talked about this a little bit in, in my talk, but we, have, we just have um, uh, one of our sort of really fast sort of uh, feedback things that we have running through uh, CI is just uh, a command that which just loads up any packages which have been checked in. Um, mm -hmm. And just the act of loading them just gives you a warning or an error if something screwed up with it, whether you like, missed a, um, you forgot to check something in or something mm -hmm. like that or broken a reference. Um, and uh, since cooking takes so long and it's so difficult to get um, fast feedback to artists, um, just that sort of loading things up means that you know, within 10 minutes you can let people know whether they've screwed something up. Yeah, yeah which, which has been great. And I think even if uh, people forget to check this themselves, we still run the same thing uh, post-submit as well anyway. So anything that does get uh, missed by the person checking in is uh, caught very quickly. And I think, I think on the bigger teams, you really need that to kind of be able to pump out your builds very frequently and uh, have something for QA to test. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd just like to bring attention to, I uh, meant to mention earlier, is there's a, an email address here. We'll be taking questions at the end, but we're taking them via email. We've got a whole panel of people here, so we didn't want to just do sort of, you know, first question gets answered and nothing else. So if you want to send an email with a question, I'll read through those, and then we'll ask one or two as much as we have time for at the end, but it gives a bit more chance to, um, to think about them. So please drop some emails using your phone during the talk, and we'll, we'll try and look at those at the end if there's time. Um, so speaking about sort of problems that pop up, you talked a little bit about um, how you're looking at loading packages and generating problems that way. Uh, how do you draw attention to, to broken builds? Um, do you have a, I've heard of studios with rubber chickens that they hand to people <laughs> who break the build. Uh, but how, how does that sort of stuff get surfaced? You know, what's a, what's a way that is effective and, and doesn't feel onerous? I was kind of curious if different studios had different approaches to, to tracking down problems and assigning blame. Like, I can say from our end, because we do not uh, like actually do a lot of pre-commit reviews or something like that. From our end, it has been a lot actually on like a little bit on a different end. Uh, it has been a lot about having completely every single day, everyone is playing the game in the morning at 10 AM. And if the person breaks ever the build that existed in the 10 AM that happened in the morning, then that is the person that broke it and needs to be able to fix it. And on that level has been, to some extent, a more public shaming. And uh, on a lot of aspects that they understand the scope that inherently they were doing to the product that they inevitably wanted to do. Because while certainly I understand like three, 400 people and like across regions and all that stuff, but from our end has predominantly been a lot about like seeing actually what the reflectance of a build breakage is in regards for what the product development had been and realizing that these are like inherent tools from our end, because we're very much afraid of providing too many processes of what the steps you have to go through, because that eliminates speed when it comes to like live game service management and be able to respond to failures. Yeah, we, we tend to err on the side when possible of not fixing breaking changes. We just back them out. Yeah, so it's also, if, if yeah. we can find it, you know, that's kind of a function of how much automated build resources can you throw at the problem to isolate a single change list to being the thing that broke your build. But by just backing that change out and moving on. Um, we, as some other talks I think went over, um, we don't allow anybody to submit when the build is broken. So we essentially say uh, either code is broken or content is broken. Um, and if code is broken, nobody can submit anything under, under source or under engine. If content is broken, nobody can submit anything under content. Um, so that really pushes people to kind of take accountability um, to either back out their changes if they, if they can or, or work on a fix. Um, one of the things we found was actually, you know, at certain stages in the project, you don't necessarily care if the build breaks, but because you're, you're trying to iterate fast, you're trying to prototype, um, and, and it's expected that things are going to break. Um, and we actually found that you know, we had a dashboard that was saying, time since build last broken. And we were, we were looking at that, and we were saying, actually, you know what, this, this you are what you measure. And people were looking at this statistic and saying, if I don't check this in, if I don't check anything in, then the build will never break. And this, <laughs> our time since last break will go up. Um, so we actually changed our metric to um, time to fix. So we accepted that the build was going to break at this stage in the project and that it was an inevitability because we're, we're iterating. Um, the important thing to track was how did we react? You know, how long did it take us to actually get a fix in that allowed us to go green again? Yep. So. 
feel like we have a quite a, a lo-fi solution to the um, <laughs> build health, uh, which is we have all the little badges in UGS and things like that, and then we just have a very vigilant uh, technical lead on the project who goes and pings everybody and chases them up whenever they screw things up. Um, uh, like we do, um, outside of the stuff that we build for uh, Unreal Game Sync and Surface in that, uh, we do full builds of the game every six hours or so, and uh, our QA department just chases up build errors from that. Th those builds are sort of gated on all of the other things that we uh, show inside Unreal Game Sync as uh, succeeding first. So um, that's kind of like our health check, and then they follow up by email based on that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably somewhere in between. Uh, we're kind of kicking off builds every two to three hours, and um, if there's an error in the build, Team City does a pretty good job of kind of reporting uh, just the people who modified in that time and email just those, plus a few people like myself who, and QA who can uh, go and hassle the person who it most likely is the, the cause of it. Um, oh, it might be worth mentioning, uh, like one of the things that we're working on at the moment is a is kind of like a more uh, like an, a more automated blame tool that would be integrated with Unreal Game Sync, like something that would like pass through log files and then find out like the the paths to files or pieces of content which have changed, figure out who changed it last or in which branch and stuff like that, and be able to like if you have something that fails to compile on multiple platforms, like merge those into a single bug and then just have a kind of not like a bug tracking thing, but like a got a more interactive thing inside in Real Game Sync where it'll pop up a little notification for somebody and say, do you acknowledge that you caused this problem, or do I have to escalate it to somebody else who'll come and uh, bug you about it and stuff like that? So that's one of the things we'll hopefully get in for 423. The benefits of doing more automation mean that you can start to run analytics over your build stats, right? So you can tell which files are likely to cause build breaks. You know, the, the, the change list that, that most often broke the build, you can, mm. you can start to track statistics that come out of your test runs and, and flag up if you know, X number more assets got loaded after this one change, for example. So being more, you know, using commandlets and, and editor tools to be able to pull out analytics from your, from your automated testing and your CI is super helpful. Um, so one question has come in three times already, so I'm going to ask that one now because it's clearly a, a topic of interest. Uh, everyone here has sort of talked about using Perforce as kind of uh, uh, an obvious, you know, no-brainer. But um, people are asking about uh, GitHub and uh, sort of Git LFS uh, in particular. Sorry. Um, so yeah, like, like, has that been given any consideration or any serious investigation by anyone? No, and, or are you aware of anyone who's who's really dug into that? Well, <laughs> well I, I've, talked to, I've talked to GitHub about it because uh, I'm kind of I'm interested to, for the, the, the public version of UE4 that we provide on GitHub, I'd much rather be using Git LFS on that so that people can fork the engine and uh, like be able to you know, start off their project using Git LFS and just upload their own content in addition to whatever we put up there. Um, it, it's kind of really messy, though, because of the... Ah, it's all legal stuff, but uh, <laughs> the fact that we we have to get people to agree to our EULA before they can get into our GitHub repo, so that means that we have to we do this weird thing where we add people to our organization, and then it turns out that anybody using Git LFS, their usage gets billed to us, and we don't want to pay for everybody's usage of free file storage on the internet, and uh, it's just a bit messy. But we're talking to them about it. Um, I think the, the the problems that Git LFS doesn't solve is the um, the ability to do file locking. Um, people can still just modify things locally, and there's not really any notification that you're going to conflict with something that somebody else has done until you try and push it back up. Um, which actually brings me to another question that people asked, which is how do you avoid contention on files? As you know, a lot of the Unreal assets are, are binary. Do you have processes in your studio or processes with development to sort of avoid those kinds of kinds of locks and contentions? So uh, I covered mine predominantly in, in my talk, uh, but it was a lot on like basically uh, if you are in a branch, you can lock, you can check out the assets in every single other branch if you inherently want to. And on top of it, our team structure is set up in a way where we're able to kind of separate what actually content people are, will be touching. Yeah. It's difficult. It's yeah. really it's really difficult. And I think you know there's a lot of content creators on teams that will say that's like one of their main main bugbears is I want to work on a piece of content, but it's locked, right? right? And they have to go chase somebody. It's in a branch somewhere kind of thing. But um, again, if you can figure out exactly which files are the most contentious, 
uh, then you can spend specific time on breaking those files up. So if you have one particular piece of content that is always locked, for example, um, which you could tell by running analytics over, over you know, perforce output, then you can say, OK, that's this sprint or this milestone. Let's work on breaking up this individual asset. Let's split it up into separate blueprints. Let's move some of it to native kind of thing. So, so targeted work on individual assets can help. In terms of conflicts and things like that, um, uh, one of the most useful things that we added last year was the ability for the content browser to be able to check whether things are checked out or modified in other branches. Um, it's a really badly advertised feature, but it's incredibly useful when you're working across multiple streams. Um, and I, I think we need to do a better job of uh, showcasing that. Um, yeah, when, when we have the, the talks and stuff online, then I, I talked a bit about it in my presentation yesterday. But um, uh, yeah, it, it basically allows you to, uh, when you go to check out an asset, it'll say, oh, hang on, somebody in a branch downstream of where you are right now has already modified the asset. So you're just going to cause a conflict by doing this. It tells you the name of the person that's changed it. And so it kind of nudges you to go and talk to them and make sure that it's OK. That's a great feature. I wasn't aware of that. Um, <laughs> I told you it's badly advertised. <laughs> yeah, it's very badly advertised. Um, so we, we do all of our development in the main branch, pretty much. We're kind of looking at the possibility of creating streams for some, some features, but uh, we're kind of treading into that territory. Uh, in terms of locking files, I think it's all the same as these guys, just splitting up blueprints, splitting up levels. Nothing, nothing magic. Uh, let me have a look at the next one that I just saw. I can, oh, so a couple of people are asking about how we distribute builds internally. I know that's something we sort of touched on. People were saying they use UGS, but apparently, you know, people may not. Apparently, there's, there's folks who are not aware of what that does and how that works. So I know Ben, do you mind maybe Ben Marsh? Do you mind maybe oh, giving sure. you a quick overview of like what UGS is, what it does, why you should use it, um, and you know maybe how we distribute builds both to uh, programmers and to artists in in Epic. Yeah, so uh, Unreal Game Sync is this little C Sharp application um, made using WinForms that uh, currently only exists on Windows. And uh, it kind of it basically just gives you a list of all the changes which have been checked into uh, a stream. And you just double click on which one you want, and it'll um, sync down all of the, the code and content of that change list and then build it. Um, that was the way we originally designed it. And then we retrofitted this ability to it where it can also, uh, rather than just building it locally for you, uh, it can fetch a zip file of the editor binaries from uh, somewhere else in Perforce. Um, so that's the system that, so everybody at Epic, whether they're an engineer or um, a content creator, uses the same tool to sync down builds. And we use the same tool to like, notifying people because they always have it running and things like that. Um, and uh, content creators can download the zip version of the binaries, and engineers can compile it themselves. Cool. Any other comments on, yeah, on we sort use, of build we distribution? Yes, for, for exactly that purpose. We pull down zip binaries. In terms of you know, distributing game builds, there are certain platforms that are relatively easy to, you know, at the start of a project, potentially integrate and put your, you know, your game builds up on there and distribute them to your team. It's a lo fi solution, but it, it generally tends to work. So. Cool. Um, so one question for everyone. Do you use a distributed build system like Incredibuild? And uh, if so, what are your sort of feelings on that topic? They can be expensive, but they can be a big time win. So just curious. Maybe start down the other end this time. So Mr. White. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we use Incredibuild. And um, I think we looked at uh, fast build, couldn't really get it working, or it didn't seem to be quite as effective as Incredibuild. So uh, yeah, I think we're, it's, for us, it's absolutely worth the money. Yeah, Incredibuild across the board. Uh, um, yeah. It's also super useful for, I should mention, for not just for compiling code, but for compiling shaders as well. Um, whenever somebody like, changes like a material or something like that, or you get an SDK upgrade that causes all the materials to be invalidated, it's super useful to be able to uh, just kind of bound the time it takes to do a cook. Yeah, we're using CrediBuild um, across different projects. And yeah, can appreciate that it's a, it's a large investment for a lot of teams. Um, the business case kind of makes itself once you look at the actual time saved and the amount of developers. We've also kind of investigated fast build and another kind of third party platform providers distribution tool as well. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we sticking with Incredible. 
Yeah, we use IncrediBuild, uh, although uh, yesterday uh, one of the RTAs told me that FastBuild actually now really works well in 421 or 422, so I guess when I'm back in the office, we're going to try out to see if FastBuild now works. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, I guess, uh, like, uh, as those guys said, we use IncrediBuild, it will save you a lot of money. Like, actually, in the end, if you actually pay the money upfront, it's a really good tool. I guess the main, the main sticking point for us for yeah. any other kind of distributed build system is that if it's not maintained by Epic yep. upstream in the engine, if the integration isn't maintained, then it's extra engineering work. We have to do every update. We have to say, OK, is our fast build integration working, mm. for example? And if the team is now reliant on that, that, that could potentially add weeks to your engine upgrade yep. schedule. Um, but yeah, if it's maintained by Epic, it's a much easier. Yeah, I think I broke third party distribution tool in 4.22. Sorry if anybody's using that. <laughs> Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, one of the issues that I've sort of heard about um, when you're building a project with Unreal and you're sort of rolling along building it is it's very easy to, for everything to get referenced and then your load times for the editor slowly balloon uh, and you know, you're spending 15 minutes as it loads every asset in the game every time you start the editor. So um, I was wondering if people could maybe talk, we'll start down the other end again, of just like if there's any sort of learnings you've had from project to project on how to structure the code and the content or the way content references other bits of content to try and have a fast startup so you can iterate quickly and not just end up loading all the things. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a great answer other than just continually monitoring it, checking how things are referenced. Um, you know, we occasionally just do a pass on checking what gets loaded at startup on the editor in, in, in the game and just making sure it's as tight as possible and, of course, using soft asset pointers and things like that to, to manage your references. But uh, I, I think it's just one of those things we just have to constantly be uh, on top of. Yeah, on, on Fortnite, we, uh, we use soft asset references like pretty heavily, and we have like a few utility functions that will just kind of, uh, you know, you pass it a, um, a soft asset reference, and it'll either get it from memory or sync load it or whatever. Um, it is kind of, it does allow you to get into the editor a lot quicker. Um, if you want to sort of import a mesh or something like that, then it's kind of useful. But then as soon as you pie and you end up loading uh, all of the game assets, then you end up loading all that stuff anyway. So it ends up kind of being a bit hitchy. So it's, you kind of like trade it off. Um, it is one of, the, um, one of the most useful automated tests that we've added is the, uh, the uh, editor startup time test. It's really easy for somebody to just introduce a hard reference to a blueprint which then references like a bunch of different content and then just ends up loading up half the game uh, at editor startup. Um, and so we, uh, like we added an automated test that we, we don't have a lot of automated tests, but one of the um, most useful ones is this one that just takes how long it takes to get into the editor and it catches a lot of stuff. Yeah, I think in, in practical terms, yeah, soft, soft references are basically it. Um, but there's also something to be said for you know, communication and education across the team of the impacts of hard references and what it can do to your productivity, your team's productivity. If you are doing any kind of validation of people's changes, maybe check if they've had hard references and have a conversation with them about why they should consider their choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, what we also do at Jaeger is we, uh, for a lot of these different operations, such as like opening the editor or compiling the build, we send these things as individualized time series over to a database and then visualize it through Grafana. So we're able to see per day what actually our different employees are actually spending doing things. And obviously, on a day by day basis, then we can see, oh, hey, it now takes, like, now we lost three uh, days of employee work of just opening up the editor. And on that level, we're able to very much easily track what actually is the most problem, because it will not only be in your editor load times. We can talk about compilation times, opening the map, saving, building lights, and so on and so forth. Being able to track these things becomes so much easier for us to motivate to production why we inherently need to work on these things. Mm -hmm. That has helped us a lot. Very cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. So just speaking more broadly, are there anything, I'm stuck in the middle this time with Jack. Uh, <laughs> is there anything? Uh, any things that seemed like the, a good idea at the time and have subsequently seemed like they really weren't a very good idea at all, and you, you've definitely regret, regret doing them. So maybe you can, some people can avoid making uh, the same mistakes. Yeah, I've got a, a very specific example, but don't get online subsystems through the get world, <laughs> uh, through the, just the simple get online subsystem. Um, online subsystems should always come with the, the context of the world that you're using them from. So don't make the mistake of just getting the UOnline subsystem by the get and then having to go through your entire code base and change 
every way that you access the online subsystem because that's not fun. And it can have really bad impacts if you want to do things in an online sense in plain editor, for example, because your editor has its own world and your plain editor instance has its own world and therefore which online subsystem are you going to be getting? Any other anecdotes of very I'm, specific? I'm drawing a blank. I'm not sure we've made any mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are certainly things that I wish that we'd have done sooner, like um, we're really late to the party in general with uh, automated testing, and nowadays we rely on, especially for performance testing, we rely on um, like using replays in particular for um, tracking performance over time that I kind of can't even imagine a world where we didn't have that. Um, but it's still really patchy, our automation, automation, automated test coverage. Like We don't have a lot of unit tests and things like that. And, Maybe that's something that we should be uh, doing a lot more of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no particular thing comes to mind other than, uh, as you say, things which we wish we just did sooner. And that is things like the uh, pre-submit tool, um, many of our kind of automated testing, kind of um, more tests that we do before we publish tools. It's just kind of lots of things around that sort of area. Uh, from our end, it has been a lot in regards for where, like, it's not only what data and how you're referencing it, it's also where you put, have put the data. Like, when we worked on the multiplayer games, we were consistently adding a lot of network properties over to Pawn for main visualization, which is also the one that has a very heavy network frequency that needs to be updated and so on and so forth. Better usage of, like, player controller and player state has been, like, something we should have certainly done better in our previous projects and something we're doing better now. But scaling server performance in regards for what your metrics will do in server performance have been very key and been a big learning from our end. Oh, I thought of a good one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we've got we've got like uh, we've kind of got like three games in one in Fortnite now. We've got the Save the World, Battle Royale, and uh, the Create mode, and uh, like all of that stuff is jammed into one player controller, and they all do very different things. They're different game modes, um, and uh, I think if we'd have uh, separated those out earlier on, just to uh, partition them all a lot better, that would have saved us a lot of problem with well exploits like people being able to fly around the map and things like that. I think at an architectural level as well, we, we chatted yeah. about this yesterday, but yeah. like, if you can, if it makes sense for your game, avoid branches as much as possible. Yeah. You know, having to merge branches up into mainline inevitably ends up being like the most senior engineer on your team's yeah. job, yeah. and it's just a huge, huge waste of time. Yeah. It's a massive waste of time. And we, we try and follow trunk-based development and, and work in a single mainline feature flags, short-lived development branches. Um, but the headaches of mergers are just really not worth it. Yeah, yeah, like I will also fully concur. If you look at my presentation, you can see the 28 branches we created on uh, Dreadnought <laughs> and how the web of uh, craziness that was to solve in production and releasement and all that stuff. So a lot of, yeah, it's, think about that very early when you set your stuff up. Cool. Um, there's a couple of questions about DDC, Drive Data Cache, actually. Uh, and so I guess, first of all, Ben, would you mind very quickly saying what that is and just making sure every single developer in the room has one set up? Because oh, okay. that's, yeah. so, so first of all, like, first public, public uh, information announcement on that. And then um, the question was really about like, how do we set them up across offices? Uh, what sort of hardware do you use? Is it one per branch? So very quickly, sort of how, how people set those up and use them. So uh, derived data is anything that the engine has to convert into a more efficient form before it can use it. And the, the sort of the, 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 the typical example of it is uh, textures. Like you, you author them as PNGs or whatever, and they're stored in assets as PNGs. But before you can send it to the video card, it gets converted into a DXT texture or PVRTC or whatever. And that conversion uh, from a PNG into a, a PVRTC is really slow. So uh, we have a cache for those things. Normally, by default, uh, the engine caches those things to uh, a folder under the engine directory or uh, somewhere under your user folder if you're using an installed engine build. But if you're working on a team, uh, it's really, really, uh, it's, it's the simplest thing and a really, really useful, valuable thing to do is to set up a shared DDC so that everybody on your team can. Uh, can share all of these converted assets, and nobody ha and not everybody has on your team has to convert the same texture over and over again. Uh, so a shared DDC is just a network folder somewhere. You tell the editor to go and look in that for any uh, pieces of converted content, um, and it will save you tons and tons of time. Um, I guess I should add as well that it's really important that that space is super fast. Like we, <laughs> we spend a fair amount of time just kind of experimenting with a few network drives and providers to 
get something that was just uh, optimal for that sort of purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the other part of the question was, do we have one per branch? Do we have one per office? Oh. Like, what's the sort of setup? And you know, hardware. I think Ben spoke to that a little bit. Uh, so yeah, the um, the all of the sort of conversion of. Uh, uh, of assets into but the creation of derived data is very um, the dependencies are very clear very clean um, and so we're able to sort of hash all of the inputs and then map it to an output uh, so you don't have to worry about you can point every single branch at using the same uh, DDC and the hashes will just be different if they happen to be different because there's a different version of the tool or whatever um, uh, otherwise then you can share things between branches so um, so yeah, always point it to the same, um, the same location. Uh, we do have a different one for every studio. Um, we have tried a few things in the past with trying to replicate stuff from like our headquarters are in North Carolina, and we have tried stuff with like transferring that stuff overnight to um, like zipping up the whole of the DDC and transferring it over to the UK and things like that. And uh, it, it's never really worked. It's never never proved to be. Um, uh, effective. It's just too much stuff, too many little files, that kind of thing. Um, it just seems to make much better sense to just have a separate one per studio. Yeah, working with a remote studio, we basically had, um, you know, large AAA game would not have actually been feasible to, to develop without a shared DDC. And you do need the network infrastructure to be able to make that, mm. you know, work for you. But in general, we had a um, just an overnight continuous integration build that would run and populate the DDC. At, it was about six in the morning, I guess. So, so you know, by the time everybody got in in the morning, the DDC was was done. It was populated, and you know, it was it was pretty much uh, invisible to developers that they were you know having to wait for any of that stuff. So. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, the the build system populating those things is uh, super useful, and it's worth mentioning as well that it's not just it is used for cooking and for making things for target platforms, but it's also used inside the editor as well. So. Um, if you don't have a piece of derived data when you launch the editor, then it's just going to hitch while it creates it. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're, we're almost out of time. The last question I was going to ask was, um, is there any... Oh, there's so many questions. I'm sorry if I didn't get to everyone's questions. There was a lot that came in. We got through some of them, so that was pretty good. Um, is there any sort of plugin on the marketplace that you've used and, and found successful or, or useful or you know, any, any other piece of middleware that we haven't talked about that people have really dug and found helpful? Life plus plus. It was great. <laughs> we liked it so much that we licensed it, and yeah. it's in 4.22. It's it's awesome. Definitely try that out. That's for. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a better hot reload. Um, super useful for iterating on C plus plus changes. Um, it's it's fast and it's reliable and uh, it's great. It was a life changer for our uh, gameplay coders. They were just so so excited by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not having to restart the editor. You can just load everything up into Pi and then yeah. just keep on changing things. Great. Powerful. No specific plugins for me, but it's just, I guess, being aware that that marketplace exists. If you're in a, if you're on a project that's in the prototype phase and you're just trying to prove out, you know, your designs, you're trying to, you know, rapidly iterate to get to where you need to be as quickly as possible. There's no reason why you shouldn't jump on there and grab things that are going to accelerate your team going forward. Um, that if you're just leaving them in there to to prove a point and then you're not taking that prototype code any further. Um, moving into production, then yeah, it's kind of a, a no-brainer for me. Yeah, I myself do not know exactly, like I myself have not integrated plugins, but what's really cool about plugins though is it doesn't need to be an engineer itself that is adding these plugins. Like it can be whoever in your team that really would like to take this plugin, test it out, see what it goes, and then you can make a better decision afterwards. You just see what goes. So everyone should feel empowered to some extent be able to add that. Yeah, we've got some technical designers yeah, that have done sorry. a lot of that recently. Yeah. They've just, you know, been working on prototypes, found something that really works for them. Pulled the plugin down, chucked it in the engine, and you know they were up and running within a couple of days and, and able to to really prove out what they needed to. Very cool. Well, I'll uh, I'll end it there. And thank you very much to the the volunteers who came on the panel today. I think it's been very interesting to hear the different perspectives and different experiences people have had. Um, and thanks everyone for coming to the panel and coming to Unreal Fest. And I do hope it's been very useful. And I uh, hope to see you next year. So a big round of applause for the panel, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.